Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I will be acting as moderator until Andy is ready to start. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First we have a brief announcements period, then we have the speaker who speaks, we then have a question and answer period, and at the end of that is our infamous free speech forum. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. No more announcements. Tonight's speaker is Ted Aranda. What are chemtrails? Many researchers and observers believe that this phenomenon is exactly what it appears to be, a clandestine government program of releasing vast amounts of toxic particulates into the atmosphere. The ostensible reason would seem that solar radiation management, i.e. blocking sunlight to reduce global warming, so this is a vast project of geoengineering, or is the purpose something else? And all without the knowledge, much less the content, con consent of the citizenry. <clears throat> the political is no less than the environmental implications are almost beyond imagination. Are we really to be nothing more than obvious sheep and guinea pigs to the masses of the universe? Or will we finally take our lives into our own hands? Investigator Tent Aranda explores this mind-bending topic. Let's give a hand for Ted Yay. Aranda. Ted. <clears throat> We're not sheep. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim, and uh, the College of Complex, as usual. And I want to give a special thanks to Tim uh, for uh, setting up the uh, computer and the screen and all that. And sometimes I've been trying. <clears throat> Did uh, everybody see the chemtrails out there uh, this afternoon? Yes. Well, how many? How many people saw the chemtrails? Inside. One, two, three. At least three. Okay. Uh, there were obvious uh, chemtrails uh, at times all the way across the sky on the north to the north of us, uh, to, and then a few to the uh, west. There were cumulus clouds, some, uh, especially to the west, but most of the rest of the sky was a chem sky. It was an artificial sky. Most of that was aluminum. Okay, now that might seem, it's probably hard for some of you to believe because it's pretty outrageous, but that's the truth. <clears throat> so uh, let me continue. Uh, just yesterday, I watched uh, John Barton's talk on Henry David Thoreau. I couldn't make it when, when it was actually here because I was out of town. And it was a fine presentation. Um, and as I was watching it, uh, I was thinking, what would Thoreau and other reformers of the past, and, all, and just plain good people, and not necessarily famous people, <clears throat> who have wanted progress and worked and fought for progress in this country, think about where we are, how we are today. We are fast becoming a living dystopian nightmare. We're going backward. And if we don't turn this ship around, we're going to be in big trouble, we already are, and we'll be a seriously worthless bunch of human beings. Okay, sorry to start off on such a bad note, so let's continue with the bad news. <clears throat> Hi, Ted. Yeah. Thoreau said, it's a good thing we're not able to fly because we pollute the sky too. <laughs> <laughs> if only we couldn't fly, we'd be better off. Okay. So uh, if you'll take a look on the screen, <clears throat> I'll read this. It says, this story begins to slice through the slimy underbelly of a vile pathological beast that controls our lives and gives us glimpses of the innards of this creature that grins gleefully at our gullibility and simple innocence while trampling on our most basic human rights. That quote is actually from a story, uh, an article on 9-11, okay? But it applies equally to chemtrails, to the assassination of JFK, many other deceptions and crimes by our government over the past few decades. <clears throat> so that's, I can't tell, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, we live actually in an empire of deception, a tyranny of lies, and it's, it's totally out of control now. And this started, uh, believe it or not, in 1787, in, in our beginnings, okay? Because what was created at that time with the Constitution was elective oligarchy, not democracy. This business, this notion, and, and this talk about the constant in, you know, in the United States, I mean, if I have a penny or even a tenth of a penny for every time anybody said talk about democracy in the United States, 
I'd be a trillionaire, okay? Um, this is a big lie. Uh, from the very beginning, we had uh, an elite in control. And in 1947, they went a step further and created uh, what we now call the deep state, uh, a shadow government, the military industrial intelligence complex. They passed the National Security Act, which created the CIA, the Department of Defense Establishment, okay? And so they decided, that our elite decided that they, uh, the oligarchy that we already had wasn't effective enough for them to lord it over, over us. So they created a, a more direct, but at the same time more covert control. And so this, is, this isn't a, an aberration, actually. It's not a subversion of democracy. We never have had democracy. And that's why this monstrous thing, the deep state, has come into being. So chemtrails. What is this all about? It's the depositing of vast amounts, as Tim said in, in the introduction, uh, of toxic particulates into the atmosphere. Just megatons. It's, uh, it's totally uh, un you know, ridiculous and outrageous. Not just ridiculous, it's, it's unspeakable. Um, so here's a, a video of a plane uh, depositing its chemtrail, this one right here, okay? And as you see, as we widen the picture, there are more planes in the sky. As a matter of fact, this sky is full of chemtrails, okay? And that's what we see many days now, in, you know, in these uh, nowadays. Um, this is an example, another photograph. Um, this one shows very clearly the evolution of these chemtrails. Um, th this one is a, a fresh one right here. That, there's the plane at the very tip uh, you can't see. Just a positive one. This one right here is a minute or two old. This one in the middle is a few minutes old. And this one up here is maybe half an hour or an hour old. And then there are more down here. So these things are laid across the sky. And you see them as a, a sharp line across the sky. And then they spread. Okay, And we're supposed to believe, they tell us, that those are normal contrails. Did anybody ever see anything like this or like this? Uh, before, let's say in the early 19, uh, let's say the 1990s, early 1990s, 1980s? No. Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> you saw that. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I never saw anything, anything of the sort, and most people haven't. And that's why most people are completely outraged and, and concerned about this phenomenon. Fuel dumping. Planes are dumping fuel. That's what that is. So these things uh, spread across the sky, and next thing you know, we have an artificial sky, a chem sky. Uh, with monster, monster clouds, chem clouds, mostly aluminum, okay? Um, in a way, it, it could be said that we have fake skies. That's how low we sunk in this world. We have freaking fake skies, as if everything else, you know, it, it wasn't enough to make everything else fake, even our skies, they're attacking them. <clears throat> so we're told that these are contrails, normal water vapor contrails, the same kind that we are, we've seen since we were children. The little, you know, things that follow planes, okay? That's sheer nonsense. That's, that's false. Does everybody see? Now, this is a real contrail here. Does everybody see that contrail in the sky there? No. The, does anybody see that contrail in the sky? Gosh. No. There it is right here. Okay, right there at that arrow. And here's an enlargement. That's a contrail. That's a normal contrail, okay? Contrails normally are inconspicuous. You hardly even notice them. Sometimes you don't see con contrails at all. Your planes don't um, make contrails at all because the conditions aren't, aren't right. That's another uh, contrail on the same day. Does everybody see that one? Does anybody see that one? It's right there. Okay, that is a normal contrail. Now on, on this day, this is another day, clear day. We haven't had that many clear days, by the way. They're becoming more and more rare. But this is uh, another clear day. And now the contrails are a little bit longer because the conditions change, right? Does, does everybody see this contrail? This one right here, okay? And then um, there's another one. So that's about as long as, as normal contrails get um, in clear skies. And this guy, Jeff Nelson, a former commercial air pilot, explains what's going on with normal contrails. And I could quote several, you know, uh, any number of people like this who know about this phenomenon, contrails. You know, they're, they're pilots, they're experts. They know what they're talking about. Um, this guy was a flight instructor for nine years, including the lead instructor at the largest flight academy in the world. He taught pilots about engines and weather. So this is what he explains. This is, the first part of this is a paraphrase, paraphrase and then I quote him directly. <clears throat> a jet engine is very simple. It sucks in air, compresses and combusts the air, 
<clears throat> then blows it out the back as thrust. When the hot air exits the tailpipe, the contrails occur because of the very cold air at flight altitude, which is about minus 50 to minus 70 degrees centigrade. Water vapor in the exhaust, produced by the combustion of the fuel, turns to ice crystals, and that's what you see as a white stream behind the plane. Those ice crystals quickly dissipate through sublimation and mixing with the surrounding air, and the trail disappears. It never lasts more than a minute, usually only seconds. What we're seeing now, and I first could not believe it, these are not normal. They're not natural. It's got to be some outside influence doing that. <clears throat> so chemtrails are not contrails, normal contrails. And there are many ways that we know this. One uh, way is that we see there's two different kinds of trails in the same sky. If uh, these long trails were the result of the, the sky conditions, how would you have two very distinct species of trails in the same sky? Uh, for instance, in this <clears throat> short clip, video clip, you see these two planes come in from the left and the right. Okay, Something very strange happens here. The one that comes in from the right and is now on the left, this one right here, Okay, its trail is disappearing. It doesn't last more than uh, literally seconds. The one that comes from the left stays. And not only does it stay, it starts to spread like a freaking monster. Okay. And, and then it becomes this, this thing here. Uh, that's called a spreading uh, contrail. But it's not a contrail at all, it's a chemtrail. These are photographs I took uh, uh, myself the next couple. And in this presentation, the vertical uh, photographs are, are the ones I took. Um, so this was a typical chemtrail day. Here's one being laid right here. Here's one that was laid just a minute or two ago. Here's one that's a few minutes old, and then you see this huge uh, thing here? That's a contrail that has spread over the, over the past hour or more. Okay, this, this one, that is, that's the main axis right there. Okay. <clears throat> and at the same time, in the same sky, just a little over, you see that contrail there? That's a normal contrail, right there. Okay. In the same sky. And then here it is again, it, after it's passed uh, those other big, big chemtrails. So that's a chemtrail. Those, excuse me, that's a contrail. <laughs> it can get a little bit confusing. And, and these are chemtrails. Again, contrail, chemtrail, in the same sky. Another reason that we know that uh, chemtrails are not normal contrails is that modern jet engines generally do not produce persistent contrails, those long things that spread. <clears throat> So let me go very quickly through uh, the evolution of, of jet engines. Um, these are turbojets. This is an old plane from maybe the 60s. I, I didn't bother to look up exactly what year this is, but uh, it's an old plane. And notice how these turbojet engines are sleek, uh, fairly thin and, and, um, and narrow, OK? Those are turbojets. This is a modern plane, a Boeing 737. And these uh, engines are much fatter, OK? noticeably, you know, fatter. And why is that? Because this is a turbofan. It's not a turbojet, it's a turbofan. And it has a fan in the front, which a turbojet doesn't. And what, so what this thing here is, is basically a turbojet, okay, with a fan in front and a, and a casing. So they, they took like this, this turbojet and then they put a casing around it plus a fan. And I'll explain this as we go along here. So here's the turbo, original turbojet. And then they add a casing and a fan in front, okay? So now, most of the air that enters the jet engine goes around the turbojet, around the combustion chamber. There's a combustion chamber in there. So most of the air is actually, uh, this is a turbo uh, fan, a high bypass turbo fan down here. Most of the air enters and goes around the combustion chamber and comes out cold, relatively cool. It's not combust air at all. This is a turbojet, this one up here is a turbojet. All the air comes in and goes out as hot thrust. Okay, see how that's red, hot thrust? This is mostly cool. It's not a combusted air at all. And, okay, so here's the, uh, uh, the scenario again. Cool air on the outside that, that's come through that uh, casing. And then hot exhaust air uh, through the middle. And that's where the uh, water vapor would be in this um, uh, combusted air. Okay, so let me explain this um, here. 
The modern high bypass turbofan engine is nearly incapable of producing long billowing condensation trails except under rare circumstances. This is because 80% of the air that passes through the engine is not combusted at all and therefore does not generate either the volume of water vapor and particulates, which are the components of contrails, or the conditions of pressure, temperature, and humidity necessary for the formation of substantial contrails. This is what people who have investigated this thing have determined. Now, does this mean that you know, long contrails, you know, somewhat long contrails are impossible? No. It just means that they can occur only in certain specific atmospheric conditions, especially high humidity, namely 70% or higher, and usually in the vicinity of existing cirrus clouds. Okay, so let's look at clouds for a second. See, this is very basic stuff, okay? This is basic science that, that uh, actually high schoolers could, could you know, easily understand. Um, so here are the, the high cirrus clouds, um, except for uh, storm clouds, cumulonimbus, these are the only clouds up at the altitude that planes fly, which is about 10 kilometers, all right, 35, 36,000 feet. Now, it so happens that in reality, uh, in a natural sky, cirrus clouds are relatively rare, okay? They're only up in the sky uh, a minority of the, of the time, uh, at least in North America, Europe, uh, and other places where we see most of the chemtrail. Uh, chemtrail, by the way, is done in, mostly in the NATO countries, United States, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, but it's spreading in other places as well. So um, you see the blue here, okay, that's only about 20% of the time that you see any frequency of, of cirrus clouds. To see a sky full of cirrus clouds is even more, uh, you know, uh, less likely and, and not that common. So the air needs to be cold and humid for cirrus clouds to form. This explains the high concentration of cirrus clouds near the tropics. The warm air in the tropics travels up to, the, to, up to, um, travels up to humidify the cold upper troposphere, resulting in plentiful amounts of cirrus. Um, so as, that's the yellow, um, green and yellow. That's a little bit more uh, higher frequency of cirrus, but that's in the tropics because the conditions are more uh, conducive to, to cirrus clouds in that region. This is one of the few uh, studies, if not the only study, done of the relationship between, relationship between contrails and cirrus clouds before the chemtrail era. Nowadays, you see a lot more studies, and especially among quote-unquote debunkers, you know, the, the, the CIA agents, literally, okay, I don't, I, don't, I don't know for a fact that they're CIA agents, but they, I'm sure they are, they get on the uh, internet and spread all kinds of nonsense uh, studies, you know, scientific uh, facts, uh, but anyway, but this is one of the few before the contrail era. This uh, was, I think, in 1986, this study was done. So they took uh, photograph, uh, excuse me, they uh, got, obtained um, satellite imagery uh, of clouds, okay? And they found a few ex trails extending, okay? A few jet engine trails extending from the cirrus shield. There's one, two, three, four, these little black arrows, and they found a few others, but basically a handful of um, trails extending from the cirrus shield, okay? So what, this is what they found. Contrails often occur in association, in, a, in association, that's very important, with the natural cirrus and frequently spread. This spreading could extend the accompanying natural, uh, natural cirrus shield. What we see nowadays, oftentimes, is a clear, pristine blue sky, uh, no, uh, uh, not particularly humid, okay? when you know intuitively and, and determine scientifically that there should not be any long trails, contrails up there, all right? But they're full of these monstrous things, okay? In a, a clear blue sky, that's unnatural. There, there are no serious clouds in sight there, right? Um, okay, so, and we can find out, of course, we can find out the humidity up uh, at flight altitude. There's these installations, they're called uh, weather sound installations. They fl uh, fly balloons up there and they find out the, um, the uh, humidity. So William Thomas says, chemtrail investigator Clifford Carnicom correlated atmospheric readings from NASA's Climate Diagnostic Center with 21 days of heavy chemtrail gridding over Santa Fe from January 1999 to August 1999. <laughs> At altitudes where persistent white plumes crisscross the usually cloudless New Mexico sky, this is New Mexico, the middle of the desert, okay? Uh, Carnegie compound 30% humidity or less, showing conclusively that normal contrails could not have formed under the atmospheric conditions existing at the times of heavy sky gridding. 
therefore, they were looking at Kentra or Clifford County Homeless. Now, many people have found uh, that at the times of um, these chemtrails, and also Chem Sky, this is uh, Chem Gunk as well, all right, um, they're, they're, the humidity is too low. This guy uh, took that photograph, he goes inside in this short video, he gets on the internet, and he looks up the humidity data. This is the flight altitude column. He looks up the flight altitude, which is about, uh, which is uh, 9,100 uh, meters. Um, that's about where planes fly. He goes over across the, the table to the humidity column, 11%. It's too low for natural contrails. And that, that I could reproduce that uh, over and over again. Another reason that uh, we know that chemtrails are not normal contrails is that the chemtrail planes don't behave like commercial um, planes. They simply don't in many ways. They fly oftentimes in areas where there's normally little or no commercial air traffic. Now, in you know big cities, uh, who knows what those planes are, uh, are up to? Uh, you know, there's so many of them. It, it would take a little doing to determine which one is uh, uh, legitimate or illegitimate, so to speak. But um, in rural areas, some people have seen where there's not only no, uh, you know, no commercial traffic overhead. People have seen all of a sudden the sky full of planes depositing chemtrails. Where did they come from? All right. They aren't over a commercial, uh, or excuse me, they are under a commercial uh, air, air traffic corridor. These um, chemtrail planes often fly irregularly. So they appear one week or one day and spread, uh, spray, you know, and then they're gone the next. Um, commercial air, air traffic is much more regular. They fly both east and west and north and south in the same patch of sky. They fly in patterns foreign to commercial air traffic, like X's and U-turns and ovals. Okay. They oftentimes fly in formation, violating commercial flight spacing laws. This woman, uh, Rosalind Peterson, she's a chemtrail investigator, one of the main ones. She lives in Mendocino County up here. Okay. And she found, uh, she saw the, uh, the sky full of chemtrails, and the planes were going east and west uh, from the ocean uh, inland and back. Okay. She went to the FAA, or, or she sent for these uh, maps of uh, the normal traffic, and there she is, uh, where her finger is, and you, see, you can see that uh, over her there shouldn't have been uh, much traffic, just a, a you know a plane or two, and going in one direction, uh, roughly north and south. So what she was seeing was completely abnormal. <clears throat> what, this is in fact sort of what she was seeing. This is what she described. This isn't her photograph, but this is another photograph of, of planes literally going ovals in the sky like in a racetrack. And then they uh, do uh, gridding, excuse me, not gridding, uh, they lay parallel tracks, uh, people have called them like furrows in a farm field, They're obviously covering as much sky as possible. That is not normal commercial traffic. And even worse, even more indicative that it's not normal, they, they do gridding, literally, intersecting. Okay, covering as much sky as possible with that material. Uh, one little girl uh, went out into the parking lot with her father from the grocery store. She looked up and she said, look, Daddy, it's tic-tac-toe. And people have noticed that that's what they're doing up there. This is a meme that, that you know, it's common uh, that you can see on the internet nowadays. <laughs> Another indication that uh, this is not normal stuff going on with the chemtrails is that the planes that are leading chemtrails are mostly unmarked planes. Okay? Why are the non-commercial unmarked planes making long, thick, persistent, expanding trails, but the marked commercial planes are not? And not only, uh, so, so the, here are the, uh, some photographs of unmarked planes. They're all white. People have you know, observed these things. Okay, not commercial planes. And not only are they not commercial planes, they've been identified by experts, by people who know planes. Uh, as K Boeing KC-135s, at least in the early days. In the early days of chemtrailing, uh, many of them were KC-135s. They've uh, started using more modern planes, other planes as well. But that one was very distinctive. And it was a, uh, originally a, a tanker, an aerial refueling tanker for the military. And where would the military get the thousands of planes that would be needed? For this kind of program, they have the planes. Okay, 
This is the Boneyard, um, it's called the Boneyard, the Davis Montan Air Base in Arizona. They have all kinds of planes that they can use for all kinds of things. They, they just refurbish them. Those planes last a long time sitting out in the desert there. Another um, indication of, uh, of what's going on is that the, the first is Deep Shield. He's a uh, um, whistleblower. Uh, he goes by the pseudonym of Deep Shield. He says, the chemtrail fluid is passed from pressurized canisters that are carried on board via a lead system into spray jets mounted along the edges of the plane wings. So now we're, we're getting to the mechanism, the, the, the physical mechanism that's being used. These are tank, tanks and planes. And you can find a whole lot of photographs of these things on the internet. I don't know for a fact that any one of these is connected to chemtrails specifically. But this is what people describe as being on chemtrails. Now this here, we don't have to speculate about because these investigators went to the airport to photograph um, these planes. And they found nozzles, okay? These strange nozzles um, on this pylon. This thing right here that attaches the en uh, uh, um, engine to the wing, the jet engine to the wing, that pylon right there, uh, there were nozzles attached to that, to that thing. So that if, if uh, there's anything coming out of those nozzles, like a chemtrail, it's going to be exactly in line with the plane engine. There's another slightly closer up view, and another one here. Now, in this case, these last two images, um, this is from an Airbus, and the investigators uh, contacted Airbus and said, what is with these nozzles on your plane? <laughs> And Airbus said, we don't have any such standard uh, equipment nozzles on our plane. Okay, they retrofit these nozzles. They put these nozzles on the planes, uh, commercial planes as well as military planes. Now, this here is, is standard equipment. This is a fuel dump nozzle. This is common on, on many planes. Uh, so I, I'm showing this uh, because it shows you how much stuff, how much material can come out of a small nozzle. You might have said, you might have doubted that, you know, those nozzles I showed you earlier were adequate to dump a whole lot of stuff. But we're talking about nanoparticles, microscopic particles. That's what they're using. That's what they're uh, uh, dumping. Uh, and then you can also see that with those standard equipment nozzles, they could use those for chemtrails as well as for, you know, nat normal fuel dumping. Oh, by the way, the reason they would have to dump fuel is if there was an emergency and have to land quickly, they would have to get rid of the fuel. Okay, that's standard operating procedure. But they could, of course, be using those for um, chemtrailing as well. <clears throat> Another uh, way that we know that something is amiss is that on normal contrails, with normal contrails, I should say, there's a gap between the engine and where the contrail starts, which is usually around the horizontal stabilizer, the, the tail of the plane, uh, which is about 80 feet, some roughly 80 feet in, in the case of a plane this size. And why is that? <clears throat> that's because the, um, water, the water vapor comes out of steam. You know, it was combusted. It's in, the, it's in the exhaust. It comes out of steam, and it takes some time to condense into water vapor and then into ice crystals. And only then does it become a visible uh, uh, chemtrail. Uh, excuse me, a visible contrail. So um, these in, the, in these examples, you see uh, the gap there, the large gap between the engine and the beginning of the trail, right? Now watch this. <clears throat> What's going on here? There's no gap to speak of, all right? We're supposed to believe that, uh, by the way, this is <laughs> clicking a little too fast. This is not my computer. I got my, a brand new uh, computer of my own, but I couldn't use it because we didn't have the correct adapter. So, but, but we're doing okay. All right. So, but this is clicking sometimes a little too fast for my liking. But anyway, uh, so um, there's the um, trail coming out right out of, of, of the out of the uh, engine, right out of the gate. And again, and again in this photograph, there is no gap. All right, how can you have a jet engine shoot ice crystals directly out of the back of the engine in, in the super hot exhaust? Can anybody you know, imagine how that happens? No, that, it, that does not happen. These are chemtrails, and more than likely, they're coming right out of the nozzles that I showed you. Although sometimes, in, in the, especially in the early days, 
the engines themselves were used for chemtrailing, so particles would come out of the engines as well. But that, uh, according to investigators, is a thing of the past. It's, 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 they used nozzles. Okay, like I said, the, the water vapor comes out of the exhaust, the hot exhaust. It cannot be ice crystals at that point, right? <clears throat> Another uh, piece of evidence is broken trails. This is quite common nowadays, actually. You have, okay, um, at first we used to see solid um, trails, okay, solid contrails. And somebody could say, well, that's just a normal contrail. How do you have such sharp breaks in a normal water vapor contrail? Um, the people who, may, you know, try to explain this, uh, the, the, the agents, the disinformation agents, will tell you, well, there are pockets of warmer or uh, more humid air. All right, as if pockets of air in the, in the atmosphere have sharp border lines so that on one side it's one set of conditions, one foot over it's a different set of conditions. Okay, obviously <laughs> nonsense. And that's quite common. And, you, and there are videos of this too, where you see these planes laying down broken contrails. There's, there it goes, losing the trail, okay, stopping the trail, and continuing, but oftentimes <coughs> intermittently. Like so, how do you have these pockets, okay? One pocket here, another pocket here, another pocket here of different conditions, okay? Nonsense. It's not water vapor at all, it's chemtrails. Now, um, so it, it's almost as if they have an on, an on and off button, you know, for the chemtrails. This is, by the way, not a photograph, not necessarily a photograph from a chemtrail plane. This is a meme, you know, somebody made that up and said this is what's going on, which is very believable. Now, um, these, the, the reason that they have, uh, uh, they break up these, these, uh, these chemtrails, um, I think it's, it's, it's deliberate, okay? Um, because this way, when you have uh, pieces of chemtrail, when they degenerate, they become, uh, they look more like fuzzy natural clouds. So the better to fool us, instead of the solid lines, which are obvious chemtrails. So I think it's, it's deliberate, rather than um, uh, 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 some problem with the, with the delivery system. Uh, okay, that's what some people think. <coughs> so here, um, look, another piece of evidence, <clears throat> fibers coming down from chemtrails. Uh, don't worry about this, uh, what they say here. Um, I'm just, I would just want to show you these fibers. This is a video or, or a documentary from Italy, and this is uh, uh, from, uh, these chemtrails uh, are probably from Italy, excuse me, these fibers are uh, shown in Italy, but this is worldwide and across the United States, as a matter of fact. People have been seeing uh, fibers come down from chemtrails. So there's physical evidence, you know, solid physical evidence. It's quite common, uh, or it certainly was in the early days. They probably cleaned that up somewhat because they're developing their techniques as, we, as they go along. So there you have uh, fibers coming out uh, and uh, of um, chemtrails and, and falling down into the bushes and into onto the fa um, pavement. So what is this about? Uh, Deep Shield again explains: polymers are part of the mixture. The idea is simple and comes to us from the spider. Spider webbing is very light and makes and making and by making use of it, spiders have been able to attain high altitudes and travel great distances for long periods of time. Most of the elements used in the spray are heavier than air. Even in their powdered form, they are heavier and will sink quickly. Mixing them with the polymers, a synthetic carrier substance, suspends the, articles, excuse me, the particles in the atmosphere high above the surface for longer periods of time. Okay, so finally uh, we get to what I call the piece de, de resistance. Okay, actual uh, identified uh, whistleblowers that have come out in the open and explained what's going on. For instance, this woman, uh, former Army pilot Ann K. West, she says, as clear as can be, as a former commercial and military pilot, I can assure you without hesitation or doubt that chemtrails are very, very real. And I'll skip down to here. The U.S. Air Force and companies like Atlas, uh, formerly Evergreen Aviation, a known CIA asset, a contractor, are spraying chemicals in the air to modify the weather and probably for other non-stated reasons. This man, uh, was an unintentional whistleblower. That guy is uh, Terry Stewart, a manager at the Victoria International Airport in British Columbia. 
He was recorded in a December 2000 phone message responding to a local resident who had demanded to know why intense aerial activity had left lingering X's, circles, and grid-like plumes in the sky over the past two days. From what I gather, Stewart said, it's a military exercise. U.S. and Canadian Air Force exercise that's going on. They wouldn't give me any specifics on it. So for the first time, an aviation official at a major airport had unequivocally confirmed that the chemtrails were a product of a military operation. This man, Harold Walker, a former commercial airline pilot and naval, naval aviator, says he was recruited into Project Highlight, a government aerosol dispersion program which used modified commercial airliners with cabin spaces retrofitted with rows of metal cylindrical containers full of aluminum oxide, barium chloride, ethylene dibromide, and a host of other noxious chemicals. Okay? I flew a Boeing 707. We lifted off from LaGuardia and began spraying. Flew due north, just shy of Montreal. Then would essentially fly a grid, or what I called a tic-tac-toe pattern, dispensing the aerosol. Often another pilot was spraying perpendicular to our course to guarantee coverage. Crew of four, myself, co-pilot, a flight engineer, and an observer who worked for the project. Somebody asked him a question. Do you have any idea how many of these flights are taking place? Lots. And I mean lots. I was in the air four days out of seven, eight to ten hours each day. Think of all the sky that needs covering. Another whistleblower. This, one, this is a big one. Kristen uh, Megan. She was a sergeant at Tinker Air Force Base. She said, part of my job in bioenvironmental engineering was to approve hazardous materials that came into, onto the base. I was finding tons and tons, large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium in the form of oxides and sulfates. What is this being used for? Here we are violating law after law after law. Instead of protecting the people, we are poisoning the people. Geoengineering is occurring. It's been occurring. It's not new. I 100% know that the US Air Force was involved. I've had pilots come forward to me privately. I've had people come forward that actually load the canisters on the planes. These people don't come out publicly because they are afraid that they're going to end up like snow. But you said this after she was fired. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah. OK, so here we have all this solid evidence of various kinds, OK? It's a mountain of evidence. Chemtrails are real. Does, does anybody need any more evidence? As far as I'm concerned, the case is closed. Uh, let me show you a few more uh, examples of, of my observations. This was a day in, uh, I drive a, a cab for a living, so I get to all parts of the city uh, during the course of the day. This was in uh, the Gold Coast, and it was the early afternoon, and I, by this time, I'd been watching for chemtrails, right? And there had been none earlier in the day. All of a sudden, I look up, bam, here they come. They can make a very dramatic appearance, okay? And the important thing to notice here is that if there had been, if this had been a natural phenomenon with natural water vapor contrails, then you would expect the contrails to grow, you know, from earlier in the day to later in the day as the sky conditions change. You wouldn't expect, in fact, it, you know, it's impossible for the sky to change diametrically, completely, in an instant, right? No contrails, all of a sudden, you know, literally in an instant, they all, there are these uh, long trails. Okay, those are chemtrails. On this uh, morning, a clear uh, blue sky. Here goes a contrail, excuse me, a, a chemtrail, looking like it's going to hit the Sears Tower. There's the Sears Tower down there. Clean across the clear blue sky. Okay. And there it is again, uh, starting to spread. Um, and then another one coming and crisscrossing it. By about noon, this was the sky. It was a chem sky. Um, here, you, you can see though they're how, uh, how they're linear, these, these things here. Those are chemtrails that have spread. And then you also have chem gunk. It's a chem sky. Uh, another day that started out perfectly clear. So you can see this uh, phenomenon happening in front of your eyes. All you have to do is look up. Okay? Um, here goes another day that was clear, completely clear until, um, about, uh, until the early afternoon. And then here they come. Like, like sharks, you know, like the shark in Jaws, you know, <laughs> do, 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 here they come. That, you, you, does everybody see that trail there? Right, right there? Okay. And then here's another one. You can see this happening right above your head. 
<clears throat> by uh, within a, an hour or two, the sky was full of, of uh, long uh, chemtrails in various stages of devolution. Okay, and you also had a grid. There's a grid right there. Uh, two, <laughs> two lines that way, two lines this way, and then this fat line over here, and then pseudo cirrus clouds, pseudo emphasis on pseudo, and then these monster clouds. That one goes up. This is higher up in the sky. Okay, uh, one huge cloud, uh, monster cloud. Uh, this is another day, and I want to emphasize here the nature of these things. Okay, they're fat, oftentimes vast sheets of material. It, it's mind-boggling to think, you know, that they deposited this much uh, 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 aluminum and other chemicals up in the sky. Here's a chemtrail, by the way, uh, right there. And this stuff here are vast sheets of deposited, uh, spreading, uh, or having spread uh, chemtrails. Okay, monster clouds. There's another chemtrail. This is what real cirrus clouds look like. Okay, they have a very distinctive hairy look. These are real cirrus clouds, and also little curls. <clears throat> very, pretty distinctive. Those are cirrus clouds uh, photographs I took myself on one of the few. In fact, the only day I can recall that there were natural cirrus clouds in the sky. And you can see the, the little curls, okay? That's di very different from those chem clouds. Cirrus clouds appear fibrous and thread-like. They appear as long, thin strands of hair. The Oxford Dictionary says they uh, look like wispy, filamentous, tufted streaks. The term cirrus in Latin means hair. Literally, uh, the, term, the term means curl, which is where the name for the cloud originated. These clouds are also referred to as mare's tails due to this distinct feature. Chem clouds, on the other hand, have been described as invariably smeary and without contours. Massive, weird, feathery, and smudgy looking clouds. Okay. These planes are only flying at the level of cirrus clouds. If that stuff was cirrus clouds, it would look like cirrus clouds. Okay? It's not. It's something very different. But they're working on their techniques. These are more chem clouds, all right, um, that are starting to look like passable cirrus clouds or some kind of clouds. So they, they, they are seriously developing their techniques. I've been noticing this. But one thing they haven't been able to reproduce is the whiteness of water vapor clouds. These are uh, clouds. This is chem gunk. That's no kind of natural cloud. Okay, White cloud, chem cloud. And uh, clouds are only gray on the bottom because they're in, they're in uh, shadow. On the top, they're, they're quite white. Chem cloud, natural cloud. Okay, same thing there. This one is very distinctive, right? White, gray. So we're talking about, in, in very many ways, we're talking about two very different things that you can very clearly differentiate. So uh, what is this chemtrail material? Okay, first of all, let's look at natural cloud droplets. They form uh, around natural cloud condensation nuclei, CCNs, okay? And they form around dust, soot, sea salt, sulfates, phytoplankton, and other small particles. Um, they're about 0.1 micrometers in size. Chemtrail particles, and people have, have studied the, the deposits, uh, water samples and such, after chemtrailing, they uh, consist mainly of aluminum and barium, or their oxides, okay? And they're nanometer size. They're one one hundredth the size of natural CCNs, CCN, all right? So they're different in composition and in size. Uh, Clifford Conicom says the pseudoclouds are primarily solid in nature, not predominantly condensed water vapor, a unique and artificial creation, vast quantities of an extremely small water-loving metallic salt. According to the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, the only way to form artificial clouds in relatively warm, dry air is to introduce enough particulates into the atmosphere to attract and accrete all available moisture onto them. So you can create artificial clouds, but they're artificial. Okay, you have to use uh, specialized uh, uh, nanoparticles. Okay, and then the, the proportions, the water por uh, vapor proportions, uh, uh, the uh, water that condenses on them, uh, are all the proportions, size proportions are different, are much, much smaller. <clears throat> so, we're seeing um, large and various environmental effects from all this uh, chemtrail. First of all, there's aluminum overload uh, first is in the soil and water, uh, which disrupts the entire ecosystem. Forests are dying throughout the American West. 
Aluminum fatally inhibits trees' ability to absorb water. Die-offs and extinctions are accelerating as animals are poisoned en masse. Now, there are other factors involved, right? Okay, I'm not claiming that chemtrails are the only factor, but chemtrails are certainly a, a major factor in this. Drought. Excessively numerous, small, and desiccant metallic salt particles collect and retain the available moisture in the air, thereby preventing the formation of normal clouds with normal rainfall. And we're talking about drought in the west where it's, there's already relatively little water vapor in the air. <clears throat> Um, extreme forest fires. Aluminum is an accelerant. It aids the spread of fire, causing forest fires to burn dramatically hotter. Okay, you all know that you know fires are raging completely out of control nowadays uh, in the West, even into Canada. Weather, moisture patterns, heat patterns, and wind patterns are radically altered. There's been a 20% global dimming. That's a well-documented fact. Does anybody, did anybody know that? There's, there's been a dimming of sunlight by 20% over the past few decades. <clears throat> There's been a marked decrease in the intensity of sunlight around the world over the past few decades. The continued dimming of sunlight will cause crop failures due to retarded photosynthesis, among other effects, both predictable and calculable. So when you put all that stuff up there, obviously it dims, dims the sunlight. That's the intent, that, uh, according to geoengineering, which we'll get to in a second. Let me not confuse that issue. So here are a few of, you know, many photographs of forest dying in the West. Okay. In California alone, this is a recent article just a few days ago, 100 million dead trees. Um, the big, this is that uh, documentary again, the big bee mortality is emblematic. They suffer high levels of neurotoxic metals in their habitat. So there are, as you can imagine, also health effects, dire health effects of these nanoparticulates. <clears throat> the EPA calls microscopic particulates in the air regardless of their chemical toxicity, okay? regardless of what that stuff is. It could be completely inert, and it would be an extreme human health hazard that results in thousands of premature deaths each year. Asthma, COPD, that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and lung cancer have all skyrocketed in recent years. And aluminum is about as bad as a thing as, as, as you could use, okay? Um, Many time, doctor in chemistry says the major toxin in these chemtrails is the aluminum. And from the levels we're looking at, this is totally, totally unacceptable. As you accumulate aluminum over time, it causes major neurological damage. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, and other neurodegenerative diseases connected to aluminum poisoning are exploding. <clears throat> uh, aluminum toxicity, okay? Down here it says, aluminum toxicity has increased precipitously. Today, nearly 80% of those tested for metal toxicity revealed excessively high air aluminum levels. Where do people get all that aluminum in their systems? <clears throat> this is the uh, level of particulates in the air above Phoenix. Does everybody see, uh, can everybody read that down here? Aluminum is the number one uh, uh, particulate by far. 40, 000, nearly 40,000 parts per million. Okay, barium is third at two, 2,000 parts per million, per million, sorry. Uh, iron is a common industrial element, so I, I imagine that's where that comes from. But these are, you know, are from chemtrail, aluminum and barium. They're not, they have no business up there in that quantity in the air. And this, uh, and so there are other uh, uh, accompanying, uh, accompanying uh, charts that show other elements, okay, but they have to lower the scale. Now we're talking about hundreds of parts per million here for copper, manganese, lead. Here we're talking about tens of parts per million for cadmium, chromium, et cetera, et cetera. So literally, aluminum is off the charts, okay? There's the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. It's literally, uh, you know, skyrocketing. <clears throat> this is when chemtrailing started in around 1998. Okay, it was already gradually going up, but then it goes up precipitously. This is autism, the rate the prevalence of autism, all right? There used to, in, as early as, 90, as, as recently as 1975, only one in 5,000 people had autism. Now it's one in 88. Okay, again, the late 1990s, when chemtrailing started big time. Okay, it shot up. And now one in 50 children have autism. One in 50 children. And we're supposed to uh, take that as normal. <clears throat> and the common link is between Alzheimer's and autism is aluminum exposure. In case you haven't gotten the picture, they were talking about mass deaths. Deep Shield says, the World Health Organization estimates that losses arising from the Shield project, the aerosol spraying project, 
at around 2 billion fatalities, assuming the duration of the program to be up to 50 years. 40 million fatalities annually. The main factor here is the premature deaths of the elderly, prone to respiratory problems, and the people suffering from respiratory illnesses. Okay, now, some people say or think that chemtrails is part of a geoengineering project, okay? You lay, out, lay particulates up there to uh, stop the sunlight, reflect some of the sunlight, and that cools the earth. Okay, first of all, that concept is insane. Okay, that concept is seriously crazy and foolish uh, beyond words. But uh, that's a different topic. I can't get into that right now. Okay, uh, it would take too much time. As a matter of fact, chemtrailing is not geoengineering to stop global warming. And that's because that project, geoengineering, to stop global warming is called stratospheric aerosol engineering. It's called stratospheric for a reason. You have to get up in the stratosphere. You have to get up way up there to deposit the, 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 the particulates. All the chemtrailing is being done in the troposphere. Those are two different layers of the atmosphere. The troposphere is down here, where all the human activity is, you know, planes, clouds, weather. The stratosphere is a diff uh, an entirely different uh, uh, kind of atmospheric layer. It's very stable. And there's no weather up there. Okay, when you put uh, uh, particles up there, they stay up there and do their job. Okay, and that is shown to be actually true from volcanic, uh, strong volcanic eruptions, the huge volcanic <coughs> eruptions. As a matter of fact, this phenomenon is called the Pinatubo effect because there was that Mount Pinatubo that uh, spewed huge amounts of uh, uh, particulates in the air, in the stratosphere, and it cooled the earth, actually, for, uh, for a while. It also caused massive droughts. But that's, like I said, another subject. Um, now, chemtrailing is more like the small-scale volcanic eruptions, which put a whole lot of crap in the air. But they don't do, they don't uh, produce the albedo effect, all right? Because it's not, they don't get up high enough. The particulars don't get up high enough. Uh, only with the huge uh, eruptions do you get the uh, desired uh, increased albedo and the cooling. Okay. What chemtrailing is doing is actually worsening. Uh, global warming, the greenhouse effect. Cliff O'Connor comes says, <clears throat> it can be demonstrated that the introduction of essentially any metallic or metallic salt aerosol into the lower atmosphere will have the effect of heating up that lower atmosphere. Scott Stevens says, what you're doing with high cloud cover is trapping heat. You're keeping some out, but when it comes to nighttime, you're pulling a blanket over the planet. <clears throat> so in fact, as this uh, website says, there is no research to establish effective solar radiation management when ionizing salt and metals are injected into the troposphere below 40,000 feet. <clears throat> so you might have guessed what this is really all about. It's mainly a military project. Surprise, surprise. <clears throat> um, this is from the Department of Defense. And right in the headline are the whatever this is called here, the, uh, they, they start talking about full spectrum dominance, okay? Full spectrum dominance. Access to and freedom to operate in all domains, land, sea, air, space, and information. And of course, <coughs> this in, term, in global terms, we own the world, right, as Noam Chomsky said. <clears throat> okay, now more specifically, this is from the Air Force. Weather as a force multiplier owning the weather in 2025. And this is what this article says, or rather this um, paper. And uh, just by coincidence, of course, it's written in 1996, right as chemtrailing uh, started. And it, like I said, it really uh, took off in 1998. In 2025, and this, now they talk about the future, right? But they're actually doing it uh, in the present. In 2025, US Air Aerospace Forces can own the weather by capitalizing on emerging technologies and developing a strategy for the use of a future weather modification system. This is the Air Force talking, okay? This isn't some conspiracy theorist talking. <laughs> to achieve military objectives and remain the dominant air and space force. And they outline all kinds of potential weather modification capabilities. This is only a partial list. Okay, they want to deny fresh water, induce drought to their enemies, disrupt communications and radar. Okay, deny concealment, storms, cause storms, and then there are the uh, reverse, or uh, the inverse, enhanced friendly forces. Okay, improve communication reliability, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and key to this program is aerosols. 
the stuff, the actual stuff that you put up there. Aluminum bar and, and barium have special electromagnetic properties. Together, they diffuse and strengthen electrical charges. So these two investigators here have determined that dumping tons of metallic particulate matter from aircraft has geoengineered our planetary atmosphere into a highly charged electrically conductive plasma useful for military projects. That's what they've turned our atmosphere into. So you have the uh, particulates up there. How do you manipulate them to uh, affect the weather? <clears throat> Here is a facility called HARP. Uh, the HARP, uh, that's, the ac that's the long name for the acronym. The HARP antenna array steers powerful beams of tightly focused radio waves that can interact with plumes of atmospheric particles used as a lens or focusing device and thereby stimulate heat and steer sections of the atmosphere, modifying the weather and redirecting the jet stream. There are 30 major harp facilities around the world and many more smaller ones. So you have these facilities that shoot radio waves and, and maybe other energy up there to uh, work on these particles, which are special particles that react to energy. So this is, this is, none of this is coincidence. None of this is, you know, uh, all of this is very well planned. And it's not science fiction. It's not, uh, you know, something made up by anybody. There's the big heart facility in Alaska, out of, outside this little town, Gakona. Okay, it's very real. <clears throat> so what, does, uh, what do our representatives have to say or do about this mortal threat to our health, our safety, and the welfare of all planetary life? What do they have to say about this? Representative Charles Taylor, these chemtrails are nothing more than ordinary contrails and pose no environmental hazard or risk to human health. That's the line. And these other representatives, Bingaman, Luger, Thompson, and others, say practically the exact same thing. I don't even have to uh, quote them. Practically, practically, they're reading from a script. Okay. These guys right here are lovely, quote unquote, representatives. <clears throat> so this was not uh, adequate, an adequate uh, answer for uh, uh, Michael Murphy, uh, a filmmaker. He made this film, What in the World of the Spring? He went to the Capitol to confront our quote-unquote representatives. Most of them ran away from him. Most of them totally ignored him. Literally walked away, you know, uh, get away from me, you're just a kind of leper or something. And uh, when they did say anything at all, here's what, this is what they said. I don't know what you're talking about. This other one. I'm not familiar with that. Now notice these next three, They're, these are all Democrats by the way, and I didn't pick the Democrats, but that's how it should, you know, came out. But these next three are noted liberal Democrats, Marty Frank, which, never heard of it. Maxine Waters, Bobby Rush, no, never heard of it, I don't know anything about it. So Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, it doesn't matter. These people do not care about us. What else can you say? Michael Murphy uh, summarized, we made many public officials aware of this. Most of them either denied any knowledge of this or they simply were unwilling to address the situation. <coughs> Why is that? Why would these officials be unresponsive? Utterly, totally unresponsive. Because as Upton Sinclair once said, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. These so-called, emphasis on so-called representatives of ours, do not represent us at all. They represent, they're members of the ruling club. They're junior members of the ruling club. They represent the senior members of the ruling club, the billionaire class. That's who they answer to. They, they're lackeys. They're lackeys, hacks, mercenaries. Okay, that's structural. That's how the system, that's, that's the nature of the system and how it works and how it will always work. There are only ever any, just a few exceptions just to fool us. This young woman uh, in California, she tested the water in her area. She found aluminum and barium. <clears throat> this is what she had to say. <clears throat> I think we need to wake up and look at what's happening because we can't just ignore it because it's going to get worse and worse if we just keep ignoring it and pushing it away like, oh, that's nothing. So how is it that this young woman, I think she's like high school age, knows what's going on but our wonderful representatives don't? Well, she's a normal ordinary American citizen, okay? Ordinary Americans, we can have hope in them. Not that we're perfect, not that we're geniuses, you know, all of us, okay? But we have our own interests at heart. 
those quote unquote representatives, they have other interests to take care of. <clears throat> so when I say, and I've said many times, most of you know this, that what we, what we need in this country is actual democracy, the rule of the people, okay, and a, 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 a system specifically set up that way with the proper institutions. I am not playing. I am not kidding. This is what we need. I'm serious as a heart attack. Okay, and we, I don't, I'm not talking about some ideal, some fuzzy, um, you know, uh, ideal way, way, way in the future that we have to get to some, someday. No, we need it now, not some romantic ideal. As the chemical, uh, California Chemical Resistance says, when our free people no longer have a say in the air that they breathe, they are no longer free. Think about it. Someone or some group of persons now have the power over the air we breathe on a daily basis. Dane Wigington says, we have a very small group of incredibly psychotic people that literally run the planet. <clears throat> so we have to understand the basic truth behind the major episodes in our recent history. JFK, 9-11, chemtrails. In each case, the evidence is super abundant and decisive. We have to know for a fact that we are being deceived and tyrannized by our government. It's not some inscrutable, unsolvable, quote unquote, mystery. The reality of off the scale criminality by our monster rulers is manifest and beyond question. In the case of chemtrails, we're talking about these monsters messing with your air supply, with our clear blue sky, which is becoming rarer and rarer. Two words, absolutely intolerable. Thanks. That's it. All right. Who's the moderator? I'm not going to pick on people. Who's the moderator? Andy. Andy. <clears throat> Let me start with this gentleman. Yes, sir. Well, I don't. In America, the key cliche is follow the money, and you have decided that it's drifting up to the billionaires. But how are they going to live on this planet if it's destroyed? I mean, have they got a, a passage to another planet? Or, I mean, what's the, I mean, it's like, why are they doing it? Um, <clears throat> that's a, a good question. Um, these people repeatedly have shown that their, their primary uh, uh, desideratum is the technical term, right? What they want is power and wealth. Okay, um, they, that trumps everything. They might have, first of all, some people have suggested that they would have, they have anti antidotes or some escape plan, or they have underground cities or whatever. Okay, I don't know exactly uh, what they're thinking, but we do know that uh, they repeatedly uh, are after money. They'll kill people for money. The, the war in Iraq, the so-called war in Iraq. Okay, that was for American empire, for you know the uh, the increasing the, the wealth of, of, of contractors and billionaires and, and Dick Cheney, Halliburton and all that, right? At what cost? At the cost of killing, you know, a million Iraqis or so, right? If they can do that, they can literally do anything. So they, they've shown over and over again that that's what they want, uh, at, apparently at any cost at all. Uh, they might think, uh, they're so selfish, okay? They think, okay, most of these guys are older, right? Old, even, you know, uh, in their 70s or 80s or whatever, they might figure, well, um, I'm going to get rich, I'm going to be powerful and, and happy and tell with everybody else. They might think just that. They might not, they might literally not care about the rest of us in the future. Let me make an additive yeah, to that. Sure. I lived in Switzerland for many years, mm -hmm. and one of the th thoughts that came to my mind is why didn't Hitler invade Switzerland? He invaded everywhere else on the continent. And the main reason was that rich people all over the world were hiding their money there. Now, the question comes, what happens when those people die? What happens to their money? Well, lawyers are supposed to know what's going on, but it doesn't. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a delusion. I mean, all what you have all this wealth that you can't even spend. Well, power is, um, is a large part of it. Wealth gives you power, and, and they want to stay on top. And by the way, with Switzerland, I've also read that um, another reason is that uh, the Swiss were all well armed, and, and uh, they had uh, uh, good defenses. 
Yeah, it wouldn't have been easy for, for him to for Hitler to invade Switzerland. It's, it's, it's an Alpine country. There's a question right here. <coughs> okay, uh, listen. Uh, those pictures that you show with those uh, Nazi you know, uh, lines, did you say recently in the farm? In the farms? Those, you know. I took those all from you know, Chicago. With, with the, where, where all those photographs I took were, were from Chicago. When? Recently? Uh, yeah, un until recently. I've been taking f pictures for the last few months. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a particular area, perhaps? You don't need any particular area. Oh, they were they were out there right today. If you were, were out there right today, uh, this, this afternoon, uh, you would have seen some. some. Just look up. Right. <laughs> so yes. why, why do they do this? What, what is the purpose? Mo mainly um, a military project. To what? To, to create war? To, to, to rule the world. I mean, why did they make nuclear bombs? Dennis, you got a question? <clears throat> well, thanks, Ted, first off, for your presentation. Sorry I missed part of it, but when nature calls, you know, you got to answer. <laughs> well, my question is this. Now, you have to say you have findings about chemtrails and nanoparticles. Have, they, have these been published in any peer-reviewed scientific publications, or are they just put up on some website? Um, well, first of all, I, I don't know about uh, uh, peer-reviewed articles. Secondly, when you say so, uh, just some website, that's a pretty uh, kind of um, negative way of, of putting it. There is science, okay, and there is science. Science is not limited to the ac academy. Um, there is a, a um, an article that you can look up uh, that, that shows that not like 99 percent, like literally all but one of a large body of, of actual academic scientists denied that chemtrailing was going on. That, that chemtrailing was anything but, you know, the, what the official story says. All right? In, in, in front of, in, in the face of all this evidence, uh, they just deny. Okay. So um, I don't go by necessarily this quote unquote peer reviewed uh, uh, standard. Uh, I will take. Uh, there are other scientists. Okay, whether they have uh, whatever degrees they have, and Clifford Conicon is well educated. Others uh, among these people are, are quite well educated and, and, and trained. Okay, um, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't judge these people by whether or not they wrote an article in a peer-reviewed uh, magazine, or, or whether or not they have you know several PhDs or whatever. Okay, um, we people, ordinary people, okay, with some education and some scientific background, I have a, some, something of a scientific background myself, um, we have to determine these things for ourselves. We can't rely, we, can, we can't wait for a peer-reviewed article to come out and say 9-11 was, was uh, a government uh, inside job. When, when, has anybody seen a peer-reviewed quote-unquote article saying 9-11 was an inside job? But it was, because we have a ton of evidence uh, that we can determine uh, by ourselves. He and Andy Does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm finding this hard to swallow and believe because I support the Warren Commission report on JFK. I tend to believe the 9-11 Commission report for the 9-11. I also happen to believe that when I looked at this subject matter a little bit earlier this week, that there were several sources that there was this naturally occurring phenomenon because of the increase in aviation and other things. Comment and tell me why I'm wrong. <coughs> okay, well, I don't have, obviously I don't have time to No, talk no, about just, just very briefly. Yeah. Tell me why I'm wrong and mistaken. Right, okay, I'm going to answer your question. 9-11 um, and the Warren Commission, that's a different subject. Okay, so strictly uh, okay. uh, just limited to, to chemtrails. Um, you said that it's a natural occurring phenomenon? No, it's it's that it can be relatively explained away. Okay, by increases in aviation? By increases in aviation, mm -hmm. by the higher the planes fly, mm -hmm. by the amount of flights that are going on today, mm -hmm. and that it was, planes are flying a lot higher, a lot faster, and that there's been a general increase okay. in traffic. Okay, um, was there a huge increase in traffic in 1998 specifically? Or would, it, would you expect it to have been gradual? It's been a gradual thing, but if you take a look... This phenomenon was not a gradual occurrence. There was no chemtrailing before uh, 1996. And, uh, I remember looking up in the sky as a kid and seeing this all the time. No. Uh, okay, let me put it this way. People who have studied this phenomenon, okay, 
have noted very, uh, it's, it's very prominent that the chemtrailing, um, uh, there were some instances of chemtrailing as early as 1996, but it really seriously took off in 1998. I remember there, there was there was there was no there was no uh, sudden change in aviation or the atmosphere in 1998. Okay, um, that's not a natural uh, thing. If, I remember if chemtrails, seeing if chemtrails I remember were real. Okay, I remember seeing this very same thing when I was in seventh grade back <clears throat> in the 70s. We were watching. Okay. No, 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 I remember I was in seventh grade, I was with my sister, we were watching these things in the afternoon wondering why there were lines across the sky. And then we, we saw three go this way, we saw three go that way, it was a clear day, and this was back in 1976. Okay, let, me, let me answer that. Okay, hold on, let me answer that. Um, there's this debunking site, um, Metabunk is the name, okay, okay. and they uh, published um, 12 pages of, of photographs saying, well, here are chemtrails before, excuse me, uh, these long persistent chemtrails before uh, 1998. Okay? <clears throat> they could not find a sky like the, like the ones I showed you full of chemtrails, uh, full of trails. They, sh they showed us uh, uh, photographs of one or two, but the only ones that they could show with anything approaching a, f a coverage of the sky were military planes, and that's easily explicable because uh, military planes did have different engines. They had um, uh, water injection, they had uh, turbojets, old, old turbojets, they also had propeller planes, okay? So that was a completely different phenomenon. But uh, you, I don't know what you saw, but people who have made it their business to quote unquote debunk the chemtrail uh, uh, idea, okay, have, were un they themselves were unable to find photographs of uh, a sky full of chemtrails like the ones I showed you. That is a, a recent, su relatively recent sudden phenomenon. It started in 1990, essentially in 1998. Charlie. It was my understanding that an article was written in 1998 using aluminum uh, fragments uh, and to spread them in the sky as a method of weather, weather control to counter global warming. Mm -hmm. That's where it stems from. And I didn't know if that's debunked or not, but that was my understanding when this all <coughs> began. It's, and it still is the theory that you, in, to counter global warming, you do the, the, the chemtrail. Yeah, that's, that's what some so people think. I, why I, I, would it be packed? Why would it what? That's generally where the issue began. Uh, it's, the, the, the phenomenon started in 1998, but as I explained, okay, it was not. Uh, it was to, it was not a, a geoengineering program. We're proposing this method. Yeah, so they proposed it. Doing it some, before it some, appeared in a scientific journal. Look, actually, actually look, yeah, can, uh, the idea of spreading particulates into the air to combat global warming actually started in 1965. There was a, uh, a study done by a presidential um, a committee. Okay, they came up with that idea. It was revived. It's probably been continuous, but it was certainly revived um, uh, by a big name, uh, a big name person, Edward Teller. Okay, in 19. Okay. There was uh, modification for warfare. But not in 1965. There are two I, I, treaties even. I, I just, I just, there's a study, Charlie, a 1965 study that explains uh, the idea of geoengineering, which is to put particulates up in the air to increase the albedo effect. Okay, so that idea of geoengineering is not new. It was revived uh, most prominently by Edward Teller, the invent inventor of the hydrogen bomb, uh, and uh, he said, oh, "We should. This is what we should do." Okay, so this is a cover. This is, uh, this is what this is. The, the idea of geoengineering, uh, and talking about geoengineering, is a cover for the military operation. I explained to you uh, in detail. So there's detail, no cover. There's two international I, I, treaties what, on, the, what, on global warfare. Are you telling me the, the CIA respects global treaties? The U.S. has signed them. The U.S. has signed them. Yeah. It's not a secret. <laughs> Okay, if, if you want to believe uh, uh, that the CIA and, and, and our clandestine, uh, quote unquote, intelligence agencies, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, go by global treaties, that's up to you. The next question. Next question. Anybody else got a question? And we'll go to rebuttals. No, I, I, I didn't raise my question. Uh, Jonathan, in the back. Jonathan? Yeah, so these fibers are sometimes referred to as particulate matter. Uh, and when you 
said there was a film that we should check out called What in the World Are They Spraying? Or What in the World Are You Spraying by Michael Murphy? Yeah. So could you talk more in how they're asking these legislators these questions about the fibers and the particular matter? And could you go into that in greater detail? Because I didn't catch that part again. Uh, what Michael Murphy did when he went to the Capitol? Yeah. Well, it was just pretty simple. <clears throat> he uh, took a little, a, a little film crew and he confronted um, a whole bunch of legislature, le legislators. I just uh, gave you a, a sample and they would not answer his question. Um, or his questions, I should say. Um, they denied, essentially, that uh, any, there was any problem. This is, this is their standard uh, operating procedure. Um, they are not going to uh, confront, they're not going to address this issue. As far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. These people hang on. Yeah. And just as a quick follow up, it does seem like everything to do with math and science, at least in the last 15 years, there's been this kind of attitude that leave it to the experts, the people don't need to be consulted anymore. And that's really dangerous in the time where we need to know math and science more than ever. Yeah, well, yeah, ex exactly. We, we can use our own knowledge of science. And, and there, are the, there are experts on our side as well. Okay? Uh, some of these people are, are pretty well educated, like Clifford Conicon. Um, in the, just jumping to 9-11 a little bit, uh, there are, there's a whole host of, of, of architects and engineers and, and physicists on our side. So we're not alone with, uh, you know, without experts. Okay, uh, Tim, I just want to understand, Real quick. if you're familiar with the governmental conspiracy of the spread of dihydrogen monoxide, <clears throat> that it's one of the biggest pollutants around the world and that most of our air and water contains this so-called toxic element? No, I haven't heard about that. You don't know what dihydrogen monoxide is? I know, I can tell what it is. Dihydrogen, two, two uh, atoms of hydrogen uh, and, 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 and oxygen or something like that. But no, I don't, I don't know what it is. Water! H2O. Sorry, Jim. He doesn't know it. Dihydro. That's a good one, too. It's simple here. We've got four minutes. I could resist, okay? Tim, Tim, maybe it's your fault playing with that blender that you want aliens. What about aliens? Maybe they're playing with that blender. Well, you know what? One idea is kind of obviously on the fringe is that. This geoengineering, uh, or rather, um, not chemtrailing so much. Well, actually, okay, yeah, it's actually chemtrailing. Because chemtrailing is increasing the, the, the warmth of the planet, right? Uh, it's uh, uh, exacerbating global warming. And one idea is that um, the geoengineering uh, is not to uh, 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 prevent global warming, but to actually uh, increase global warming because uh, the aliens want a warmer, transformed planet. And so there's some idea that uh, one agenda could be terraforming. You know, the, the, uh, changing the, the planet entirely for the for the benefit of some other species or something, or, but again, that's on the fringe. I I don't I don't address that that uh, that question. But you um, think it's possible? I don't I don't know. I'm just saying I'm just saying that's something that I've heard of. I am not going to address that. I haven't studied that. No, but Charlie, that's a very good idea. The way we manage in this world, we deserve to be fucked out of here. Um. Okay. Then you tried. I, I don't think you succeeded. Uh, your method of differentiating chemtrails and contrails optically lacks any, any precision. Um, now, from what I understand, your colleagues, your pals, said, well, we'll test the soil to see if, if any chemicals fell from the chemtrail. Uh -huh. And then they said, well, they came up with what you had here was uh, they found aluminum <clears throat> and then they found iron. Um, actually, aluminum and barium yeah. is, is the main thing. Yeah. But that's precisely what you would discover because aluminum is the second most common element, <coughs> metallic element, in the crust of the earth followed by iron. Uh, not so only exceeded by silicon. Not, now, not. if I, wait a minute, I was thinking about this. And you're talking mad. But I said if I tested my cat's litter box, 
I'd get the same results of aluminum no. and iron. No, uh, Charlie, these guys are not, you know, complete That's idiots. That's the way the earth is made. These investigators are not complete idiots. Uh, so many of them are scientists, okay? They, what they tell us is that uh, we do not find aluminum in, uh, in the form, or certainly not a free form. Uh, we, don't, we don't find it in the form that we're finding it naturally uh, in, in the soil, okay? Uh, another thing is they, they uh, have not only tested the soil, they tested uh, the water. Okay, and they've also tested the, the snow on mountains, like uh, it one study. It doesn't matter where Yes, it matters. Yes, it, let me tell you why it matters. Okay. <clears throat> There's no aluminum uh, in the air, okay, uh, naturally. There, there might be some in, in the crust, in the Earth's crust, but not in the air. But uh, people have been finding uh, snow in uh, snow-covered mountains, like Mount Shasta specifically, one, that was one study, that had 1,200 times the, weight, the uh, level of aluminum that you would expect. That snow on top of the mountain, just sitting there, the only place that it could get uh, any, any chemical, okay, would be from the air, from the atmosphere. Another person studied lichens, okay, which get uh, all their uh, nutrients or, or whatever from the air, okay, they don't, apparently they don't have root systems like other plants or whatever, okay, so they uh, were, had very high levels of aluminum. So regardless of what, how much aluminum is in the crust, you know, there's crust underneath the, 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 the surface of the earth. Uh, it's, it's certainly not natural in the, in the, in the air. And I showed you those particulars. Oh, hold on, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me finish my sentence. Uh, I, showed, I, showed the, I showed you those particulars. I showed you those, I showed you those, I showed you those particulars, right? The level count, particular count in the, in the air of Phoenix, 40,000 uh, parts per million, 20,000 times the, the toxic limit. Uh, those are not, didn't come from the crust, the earth's crust. Those were in the air, and that's completely unnatural. There's no I, way to explain aluminum in the air. I'm trying to tell you, if I test my cat's litter box, what do I care about your cat's litter box? No, no contrails has passed above my cat's litter box, and I'll get the same results. You have to stop your cat licking your. That's what you did. <laughs> you have to test the spot where there were no contrails. Okay, let's wrap it up. It's getting a little ragged in here right Understand? now. Understand? Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, who has, uh, let's give our speaker a hand. Yay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important. Right. How many people want to say something or give a rebuttal? Hold your hands up so I can yeah. count them. So we're going to get an accurate count. One, two, three, four, five. Five people, that's it? No, there'll be more. Six, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, everybody wake up. Who, yeah, who yeah, wants to give, get your hold, hand up? Hold five minutes. One, two, three, four. Charlie, you're going to give a rebuttal? Yeah. Go five minutes. Go about five minutes because it's going to be four. All right, go four. Go four. Four minutes. Who's going to be first? Charlie, you want to get the first rebuttal? Get up here. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Oh, boy, Charlie. Good 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 boy, Charlie. Closest? Yeah, go ahead. Um, all right, let's thank our speaker here. I usually do this at the end, but we'll do it at the beginning here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, if you blow him, we only got five rebuttals, so we can give it a time limit. Um, if you, if you're going to have people that, um, there are people that make the chemicals, there's people that truck it. There's people that service the airplanes. There's people that fly the airplanes. Please, uh, when you're ready. All right, we'll, we'll wait. Yeah, wait till they finish, otherwise we don't hear it. Ladies, ladies, ladies. Hello. Hey. Hello there. We're waiting on you. Jesus Christ. All right. Okay. You, you gave some examples there. Are any of these cases of conspiracy? You have people that make the chemicals, truck it to the airport, uh, people that service airplanes, people that fly the airplanes, and people that see the overall program. The only person you presented was a girl, I don't know how I got about seeing her interview, but she was far dismissed from the Air Force, which was rather peculiar, right? She only had eight years. And then she had an interview, but it was like in her front room couch and somebody pretended to have a microphone. 
like a, a cardboard tube. I said, well, this isn't a new story. Um, but anyhow, a few things I'll cover about. Um, they generally claim that it began in the late 90s as an alternative to global warming, was to spread these aluminum chips, if you wish, and they would radiate the heat as an alternative to global warming. There's an article written, I don't know. Now, there's also been weather modification for warfare. And that's been around for many, many years. That's a totally different thing. Um, the, the thing about saying, well, I found out what I was trying to say is, if you go anywhere, if you go in my backyard, over which there has been no contrails, my cat's litter box, you're going to find a lot of aluminum in the cat's litter because it's the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust right after silicon. So no matter where you go, you got to find aluminum. doesn't mean there are contrails. It's everywhere. Uh, some other things. I thought, I thought the guy wanted the testimonies. The guy said he, he was not feeling well. But all of a sudden, he said it was due to contrails. I said, how did he arrive at that diagnosis? I'm going to just went to some of this. And some other things, you hit on this. And some other things, I've heard this from the uh, theorists. They say, well, the forests are dying. And I go, I lived in the forest. And I was wondering, how do you know the forests are dying? They said, well, I lived there, and I, I looked around. I said, I said well, that doesn't mean anything. I looked around the forest. The, 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 I can't remember, there's another one where they said, well, there's a conspiracy here, and it involves NASA and, and NOAA and the Weather Channel. And supposedly, the people at the Weather Channel have been corrupted and are not reporting the right temperatures or something like this, which rather really disappoints me because I do like to watch it on occasion. There have, in fact, been two treaties regarding uh, climate control uh, in this fashion, uh, whether uh, international treaties and one for the use of climate modification for warfare. Uh, it's conceivably I don't know if it's ever been established whether or not you could do this. And uh, let's say you take a dirty country like I was thinking, you take a dirty country like uh, China, India, and they're never going to come around and abide by any sort of um, rules uh, or climate treaties. So you spray this way and this way they kind of compliance de facto uh, with the, to preclude global warming. Uh, that's, it's kind of like a cheater thing. Uh, contrail photos, they're all over the place. And last of all, where's my friend Tom? Is he still here? Still here. Yeah, Tom posted an article uh, by, a, by a woman, a doctor, who was taught, again, lengthy the article, four pages, about the dangers of chemtrails. And I looked it over up, and she is not a doctor. She has a degree in our history, but she is convincing people the hazards of, of chemtrails. So hey, it's good to keep vigilant and all that. I think you guys got a ways to go, though, um, on this one. I, I think there is some efforts with the, the it. I don't know if it's going to fluctuate into uh, an alternative to global warming, though. But all right, thank Thanks, you. Yeah, all right, right in there. Yeah. That she was like Doc Whitworth. Can you call yourself a doctor? It's dangerous. How many four? No, no, yeah, it don't matter. Four? Yeah. All right. So wait, let's use yours. Let's use yours. All right, we got it. Okay, good. good. No, no, that's all right. Thank you, Seth, for a great uh, presentation. Uh, when you talk about the governments of planet Earth in the 21st century, uh, you know, a lot of times, especially during campaign season, we're uh, room to believe that we're talking about another neighbor that happens to have a little bit more power, a little bit more wealth, a little bit more influence. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, these are institutions that are completely unnatural to the way uh, all of us conduct our daily affairs. Uh, they're inhumanly greedy, pathologically dishonest, 
tyrannically violent, destructively unreasonable, fanatically selfish, and obsessively cruel. So when it comes to one of the most important uh, issues of the day, the facts of math and science in regards to the climate, in regards to uh, how likely the planet can sustain uh, human life on it for the foreseeable future, uh, there's one group of individuals that I, I don't trust anymore, and that's uh, many of the most powerful governments and uh, people who are in close proximity all the time, especially election seasons, to the most powerful governments. Because there's one truth that we know for sure from all of our uh, life's experience, governments lie. Can we all agree that governments lie? Yes. Is that something we can come to a consensus on? Okay, so the one group of people that you're not going to get the full story, you know, Depending on where you are on the spectrum on this issue, whether they're really lying in their end game strategy and it's diabolical, or it's just they really don't know what to do because they got ahead of themselves on uh, all the profits they can make off the fossil fuel industry and they never foresee that climate change would become such a big problem and now they're fumbling over themselves, well what do we do? Because we have to have an answer for the people to how bad we screwed up. So wherever you are on that, we know that governments lie. Um, Here's something that I wrote in uh, thoughts of these issues, because I, I don't know what to think when governments are telling us, yeah, with your tax dollars, we're militarizing outer space, but don't worry, we're going to tell you the truth about what we're doing on Earth. So <laughs> we've gone into cuckoo bird uh, territory on what to make up of these governments, but here's some thoughts of uh, what I think about uh, on this issue. Uh, the waves are night sea, wet paint, black. The winds are night sky, waving unnatural flags. The wild is night stars, unfading and fading glow of strange lamps. The walk is miles of soft grains of sand with something unknown waiting at the end of the path. Sun splash, gust of warm air, prompts of blink. Eyelash, we are here in a swirl of odd things. Bird stance, we yearn to shed anchors and chain links. Off ramp, the road less traveled is the one we the people sing. And that's my time. I'll just, I'll get it, Dennis. I'll, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. My name is Dennis Nelson. As an energy environmental researcher, writer, speaker, and organizer, I've had the opportunities to speak about a variety of topics here at the college. This is the first time that I've addressed the camp trail conspiracy theory, and I want to repeat what it really is, camp trail conspiracy theory. I look at credible sound scientific evidence, and there is none for the existence of chemtrails. What people are claiming to be chemtrails are actually normal water-based contrails or condensation trails have been mentioned this evening. They're routinely left by high-flying aircraft when hotter, humid air from the exhaust mixes with colder, low vapor pressure air. Those who believe in chemtrails claim that governments around the world are in cahoots with secret organizations to seed the Earth's atmosphere with chemicals and materials, aluminum salts, barium crystals, biological agents, polymer fibers, silicon carbide, thorium, etc. for a range of devious purposes. These include controlling the weather for military purposes, poisoning people for population or mind control, and supporting secret weapons programs. I simply lack the time in a four minute rebuttal to get into the absurdities of belief in a massive conspiracy plot which would require the worldwide collusion among governments, scientists, and airline company executives and pilots to amass and spray unimaginable amounts of chemicals and materials from altitudes of 9,000 meters or more. 
Scientists have tested and used cloud and atmospheric seeding for weather modification and have considered them as larger scale planet uh, geoengineering to slow down human caused climate disruption. With so many unknown factors and possible unintended consequences, these practices have the potential to cause harm. However, the chemtrail conspiracy theory is much broader. It presupposes that military and commercial airlines are involved in the constant mass of daily spraying, which is harming the physical and mental health of citizens worldwide. Here at the college, I've spoken about the scientific consensus on our climate crisis. About 97% of sci climate scientists accept that our activities are largely responsible for the current increase in average surface global temperatures. It's interesting to note that many individuals who believe in a scientifically unsound chemtrail conspiracy theory will dismiss the scientifically proven theory of human-made climate disruption. That is probably due in part because climate science denial, climate policy delay, is often conspiracy-based, just like the belief in chemtrails. Many climate deniers delayers see climate chaos as a gigantic plot or hoax being perpetrated by the world's scientists and scientific institutions, governments, the United Nations, so-called tree-hugging eco-commie freaks, yeah. gays and lesbians, so-called bra-burning radical feminists, and so-called enemies of free enterprise and free markets to create a socialist world government. There is only one connection between chemtrails and geoengineering as applied to climate disruption. If it was valid, which of course it isn't, the chemtrails idea would be an example of geoengineering, which we've talked about here this evening. As it relates to climate chaos solutions, geoengineering has been attempted on a limited scale. It is being proposed for wider application. But geoengineering is not as secretive, widespread, or insidious as the non-existent chemtrails are supposed to be. I still support a moratorium on all larger scale planetary geoengineering projects. We are running out of time, or are out of time, depending upon how you look at it. We must, number one, step up our efforts to mitigate our climate disrupting pollution with deeper reductions, and number two, adopt to the negative effects that are already appearing. Thank you very much. Dennis, I could not agree with you more. And I applaud your your uh, consensus on climate. As I've dug more into the sources of our climate change and man-made pollution, yes, global warming does exist. Yes, we have a problem with our advanced industrial civilization running on oil. What I don't hear is actual solutions to that problem. And, you know, like I said, most of you know about my uh, pro-based nuclear power with thorium reactors. I will not get into that tonight. No, you better not. Thank you. <laughs> but I do think that that is uh, one of the ways we can do it. I just know that as we advance, as a society, people are going to want people are going to want electric power. They're going to want more things to consume. We can't stop the development of the world because of, of climate science or, or whatnot. What we need to do is come up with cleaner ways to generate power. And like I said before, I know I've debated Dennis as to exactly how it should be done, but the one thing we can agree on is that you know there is man-made climate change and that we have to clean up our atmosphere or find different ways to generate power to mitigate our getting off of fossil fuels. I disagree with the way we should do it going forward, but there are a lot of areas that we are in agreement about. And again, Dennis, thank you for giving a good rebuttal. Who's next? Who's next? All right. I 
I just thought that I want to be here to tell you that I dislike to know and all of you, all human beings. We are a piece of shit, we are a virus, we are a disease that contaminated this earth, and I don't see any goodness in any of you. <laughs> Fuck you all. <laughs> All right. I appreciate hearing about all of these uh, theories. Um, and I don't know whether all of this is, is true or not. It could be. It, it might not be. Uh, but I do agree with uh, some things that have uh, been said. Um, first of all, we're puppets. The billionaires, they're puppets too. And the battle is not physical. The battle is spiritual. You see all these forces working to bring about a one world government. We'll out the Illumini, the Masons, the Bilderbergers, what goes on at Bohemian Grove, yeah. <laughs> but we are coming to the end times. And you see it all being fulfilled in the book of Revelations. When the fig tree is in bloom, summer is near. All right. Yay. Okay, Andy. I'd like to thank our speaker tonight for what I thought was a very solid science-based presentation. And as you can see from the audience, there's, a, there's two videos that I would highly recommend. If, uh, let me have a show of hands here. Who has seen the movie Spotlight? About uh, the, the, the problem with the Catholic priest. Uh, that story broke in about 2002. That movie describes better than any other movie that's out how knowledge spreads through a population when some people become absolutely certain it's real to them, the forensic evidence is solid, then they tell others and help others learn. And then when a per another person first encounters this knowledge, they say, well, there's no way that can be true. I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to look at the evidence. There's just no way that can be true. That's how knowledge spreads through the human population once something is very solid and proven. I call it the Galileo curve. It starts out on the bottom of the curve and the knowledge goes up it's slowly and then when you get up to about 50% of the public knowing something, it spreads exponentially. There's a video out that uh, by Major General Albert Stubblebine. His, uh, he's retired Major General from the Army. His job was military intelligence for 35 years. His, it's a video about how he initially, as a patriot, he thought we were attacked on 9-11 by Muslims. He believed the official story because as a patriot in the military for 35 years, he could not believe that we would have traitors in our country that could kill their own American citizens to create an illusion like that. And then he looked at the evidence, and he looked at the pictures of the Pentagon and the World Trade Center, and he said, I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and there the evidence is clear. It's easy to understand once I got by my original thought that there's no way Americans could do this, so we don't have to look at the evidence. I've been giving talks here for 10 years censored around this project. This is Project Censored out of Sonoma State. They publish this book every year. This is the 2011 edition with the forensic evidence of how 9-11 was totally done by the U.S. government with the help from uh, traders from uh, a couple of other countries. And it wasn't done by Muslims. This book, the 2017 edition, is the 40th anniversary. It's the most blacked out book of all time 
bestseller nationwide, but the people at Barnes & Noble don't even know it's on the shelf. you got to tell them because there's no coverage of this thing because they teach. You ask, there's several people ask tonight, well, how can you know something or, or why, if there's something this big, why isn't the news covering it? This book has been teaching for years. The Project Censor teaches journalism students how not to get fired and blackballed in America by steering clear of certain subjects that are radioactive. The subject Ted talked about tonight is one that's not only taboo, it's radioactive. There are several stories of uh, mechanics that worked at O'Hare way back you know, uh, in, in the late 90s. And uh, one, one mechanic um, was working uh, and he asked his uh, supervisor, um, what are these uh, nozzles under the wings? He was called in the office and terminated on the spot. Just clean out your locker, you're gone. And then about a week later, his union steward came to him and said, uh, I can, I'll finish. I can get your job back for you, but you have to pretend that you never asked the question. You, you, you know nothing about what you saw on that plane or the tanks with the little hoses leading to those nozzles. So that's, I'll be giving an updated version of the 9-11 talk, the forensic evidence coming up September 9th, and how 9-11 and the Patriot Act of Homeland Security relates to what is going on in America today. We're rapidly being converted into a police state where people can't even think about asking questions about the subject that Ted talked about tonight. So I would uh, highly recommend any of you look up uh, Albert Stubblebine on uh, his 25 minute video on the mental process that he went through being a patriotic American. I just cannot believe that this could be real and he finds out it is real. It's the same exact mental process that you would go through looking at what Ted talked about tonight. Thank you. May I have a minute, please? We got a couple minutes left. Oh, you an apology. Uh, I was a little bit flustered and flummoxed coming in here tonight. We had, I seemed to be not at my A game and gave you a hard time as you were. We were getting set up with the uh, things. I need to say this publicly. I don't hold any malice. I was just upset. And I need to apologize and make it public that I don't hold anything against you. I just sometimes I get a little bit flummoxed. And I thought that there were some things no that problem. needed to be said. No problem, Mr. <clears throat> but again, no malice was meant. I want to make it very clear that I thought you did give a good presentation, although I disagree with it, but you need to be heard. And you don't need to be given a hard time by me when you're getting set up. So again, I need to say this publicly. I apologize. <laughs> Any more, any more rebuttals? We'll wrap up here in the next couple of minutes. Okay. I'll, I'll say uh, one, one final note. Um, the subject Ted talked about is what we call uh, one that's beyond taboo. It's radioactive. You can go anywhere near it. Uh, but that's why all the congressmen just they'll, they'll run the other way if they can without even saying anything to you. Amy Goodman, uh, from everybody, people are familiar with Amy Goodman in Democracy Now, right? Well, there are famous stories of Amy Goodman turning and running the other way or ducking into the women's room, running down the stairs, if anybody asks her a question about 9 11. Now, Amy covers all kinds of things from all over the world. Uh, the website Tommy Green covers a wide range of issues, but I've never seen a single article about chemtrails. There's no articles about 9 11. These are radioactive subjects that people can, uh, their lives have been threatened, their kids have been threatened if they talk about it, public figures. Some of you know who the actor Charlie Sheen is. He was removed from the most popular television show in America because he was using his fame and notoriety and uh, celebrity to talk about what happened in New York on 
So we're, the, the public is reaching critical mass. We're moving forward. And uh, as I said, the two websites, Common Dreams especially, and Truth Out, tell about groups of citizens every day that are doing positive things all over the country to try to fight the corporate interests that are uh, going on. You got a question, Charlie? Yeah. Uh, stations like C-SPAN, in the morning they have the call in. And if you start getting off into 9-11, they cut you off. Oh, yeah. They and just cut it right off. The lady he runs that she's very courteous. I've heard all sorts of people say multitude of different things. Yeah. But do you think those are that's a malicious C SPAN is uh, what? It's no, the the uh, the word has gone it? the word has gone down from the very top, the owners of those stations. They make it clear and there have been examples. As I say, I just gave an example. Charlie Sheen he had uh, the most popular show on television. He thought he was secure in his job. I mean, it's a popular show. You know, it's worth millions every week. You don't take them like that off the air. Well, he started talking about 9/11. Boom, he was gone. He was an example to a lot of others. So you, you see, many many people that are retired that can no longer be fired from their job. Patriotic Americans have put in service in the military or intelligence or police, firefighters. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of patriots that are retired now that are talking about 9-11. So it's, uh, it's, 9-11 um, is going through the same uh, learning curve among the public that uh, the awareness of smoking cigarettes went through. I'm sorry, that C-SPAN is not a malicious... I didn't say they were. I said... I, I, I tried to tell you that they're pretty feet on the ground news thing. And they don't have any tolerance for it. You didn't give me any real explanation. The reason they don't have any tolerance for it is, is what Ted talked about tonight and what I talked about. Uh, look, look at what the Republican Congress critters are doing right now. The Koch brothers, the billionaires, have told all the people in the, in the Republican side of Congress, if you step out and talk about global warming, if you don't tell people global warming is a hoax, your contract is up at the next election. You got 14 months left, or whatever it is. They will remove you from office, and your job is over if you talk about global warming as being real. Global warming and climate change. This is billionaire dominance right down from the top. Overwhelming dominance uh, uh, for money. And in the case of 9/11, there's more involved than that. It's it's the changing of uh, America into a, basically a police state with the militarization of police departments with, you know, tanks and, well, not well, one of them has a tank that out west somewhere, but they have all kinds of, uh, you know, military hardware, flak jackets and everything, stuff coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that these vehicles are being filtered out into the SWAT teams all over this country. We didn't have a Department of uh, Homeland Security before 9-11. There was no Patriot Act. You know, our country is being fundamentally changed by the myth of 9-11. And this is why these people, patriots, are, uh, you know, risk, some patriots that are employed are risking their careers. They're still employed, but the bulk of them speaking out are people that have impeccable credentials. They're retired now. They put in service to the country in the military or uh, they're retired congressmen. Now that they're, they're not uh, worried about getting voted out of office, they can speak out because they're secure in their retirement. You know, you know, that this is what it looks like in capitalism. And one other thing, people, people were asking Ted, uh, is it possible that we have billionaires or people that would, would do something like this? Well, the Canadian author John McMurtry published a book in 1999 called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And he said, you know, 24% of any population, about 1 in 25, is a so sociopath with psychopathic tendencies. No ethics, no morals, no conscience. If you let people like that become billionaires and rise to the top, they will eat everything in sight like sharks. They'll destroy a country and they'll destroy the planet because they have no ethics, morals, and conscience. Their, their view of the world is different. And uh, this is what we're up against. It, it's, like, it's like dealing with serial killers. You, don't, uh, you, you track them down and put them in jail. So, um, you know, 
Start logging on to Common Dreams, that website. You don't get junk food news on there. If you want to know what's going on in America, check that site every day. Don't, don't look at the mainstream media. And the, the mainstream media is more dominated by billionaires. And, you know, I, I, when I listen to the radio, the news, the, the, to me, the news is mental pollution now. It, it's, you know, they, they just pollute our minds with all kinds of junk, and there's no time left to tell us what's really happening. And so, you know, reporters can say, well, I haven't got time to talk about that because I was assigned to uh, go to the, the Petunia Festival. I had, had to do a story on that. Or uh, the latest dog show with little poodles running around and everything. That's, that's photogenic. But you know, not, no, no time left to tell us about something like this that might matter. So um, I'll have a stack of books here. You talk about peer review. Well, uh, there's scientists that have impeccable credentials thousands of them that have been publishing articles and books on the forensic evidence of what happened on 9-11. And if we don't, uh, uh, we have to address that as a poisonous tree that was planted in this country on 9-11, and we're, Trump is one of the fruits of that tree, All right, along with a bunch of others. Well, that, if that, that's it for tonight, then. Let's wrap it up. No, we got Ted to get the last oh, word. Yeah, I'm sorry, our speaker gets the last word. Uh, you're up, Ted. Did you need the projector, Ted? Okay. Uh, let me Thanks, just address a couple of things. Uh, I was a bit distracted uh, thinking of something. <clears throat> um, Dennis, you say that there's no scientific evidence. Okay. I thought I presented quite a bit of scientific evidence. Um, I have a PhD in history. I have something of a uh, of a um, background in engineering. But I'm not a specialist in uh, chemtrails or uh, atmospheric uh, science. But uh, the people that I've studied, many of them do have such a background. Um, and they know what they're talking about. Just because you don't find their studies in a particular place, uh, peer-reviewed articles or you know, talked about um, in college lecture halls or wherever you think that science resides, that's not the entire li limit of science. Uh, science is about learning what the world is like. Yeah. Uh, Galileo, in what, the 1300s or whatever, he was outside the realm of the established scientific worldview. Okay? Um, science is something that you figure out using this thing up here. Okay, what's, what's in there? Uh, it's not something that you necessarily read from any particular source. Um, how does one explain those, uh, a gap, uh, excuse me, the lack of a gap between uh, a, a jet engine and the beginning of ice crystals uh, coming out of that jet engine uh, super hot, okay? Uh, way past uh, um, uh, the boiling point. It's, it's supposed to be steam, okay? At that point, how does one explain that scientifically? Um, how does how do you explain fibers coming out of allegedly water vapor contracts? People have reported this over and over again. Okay, um, how do you explain those sharp, broken trails? Um, you, I, I, do you really seriously think that there are bubbles of air that are radically different in in, in, in atmospheric condition? Uh, you know, feet literally inches apart. Okay. Um, how do you explain uh, you, uh, contrails, uh, allegedly uh, water vapor contrails, forming in uh, atmospheric conditions that are not conducive to such things? Uh, clouds don't form in any old sky. Co clouds don't form in, in, in dry skies, uh, and neither would, contra would natural contrails. They're, essentially, they're very similar things. They're particles with water vapor that condenses around them. That requires certain specific conditions. Uh, Clifford Carnicom documented, uh, he's a scientist by the way, he documented the, um, the creation of, of, of these trails in the uh, dry New Mexico desert, okay? And, and how does one explain the su sudden uh, uh, on onset of chemtrails in 1998, okay? Uh, in 1995, there was no, uh, I'm sorry Tim, I, I contradict you, there, there was no huge uh, amount of chemtrail, okay, or, or these quote-unquote persistent contrails. 
in, 19, in the year 2000, uh, they're huge, okay? They're all over the place. Um, the, 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 the change in the, um, any evolution of, of, of aviation or the atmosphere is not so sudden. It doesn't happen from one year to the next. Uh, how does one explain the radically different flight patterns between normal commercial flights and those crazy uh, uh, greeting? Okay, uh, are you, are you trying to tell me the commercial flights? Okay, because if you say that uh, uh, c c uh, these trails are normal, um, then I, I assume uh, when, when I assume you're, you're saying uh, that they come from co regular commercial flights, right? There wouldn't be any special planes making those special uh, uh, contra uh, trails. So how do you explain these radically crazy uh, flight patterns coming from commercial planes? Commercial planes do not fly that way. It, I, sh I, I had a, an entire list of the ways that those planes fl fly differently from commercial planes. How does one explain that? Uh, so the evidence, uh, the scientific evidence, whether one reads it in a peer-reviewed article or not, uh, I think is clear. And the, many of these people that I just gave you, uh, you know, a, a small amount of the uh, plethora of evidence or, or the explanation of the evidence um, that many of these um, people have uh, gone to great lengths to, to uh, gather and explain very well. If, if you or anybody is actually interested in, in finding what's behind this phenomenon, uh, you would do well to uh, check out, go online. Uh, there's a lot of good information online. You have to just choose it uh, and, uh, carefully. Um, and there are very many good uh, uh, articles. Uh, there are a couple of good books. Uh, there are um, very many. There are a number of good documentaries, which ex explain convincingly that this this is a different phenomenon. Chemtrails are not contrails. Um, and uh, I mean, what, what else is, is there more to say on, on that? So, um, Frank uh, uh, is Frank still here? Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, Sometimes I think that we would be better off without humans. In fact, it is my opinion that we, we would be better off with, without human beings on this planet. Not we. We wouldn't be here, but that's fine. The world, uh, life, uh, other life on this uh, planet, which has every right to be here uh, and, and to grow and to, and to flourish undisturbed, would be much better off without this virus of humanity. So we have to uh, change our nature. Human beings have to evolve. And, and post haste, so that we're not such a, 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 a bleaked up, a, 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 you know, excrescence on this planet. We really have to uh, change radically. What else do I? Should I say, um, John? Uh, yeah, um, these people are almost literally, you know, almost literally. I mean, some people think that some of these. These people that they rule us are, are literally aliens, are literally not human beings. Uh, but whether or not they are, and in fact, they are, they are inhumanly greedy, inhumanly violent, inhumanly sick, inhumanly psychotic, okay? We have to take the power from them. We have to, uh, us normal people with, with, with common decency, which, which most people out there on the street have, okay, have to take the power from these seriously sick, beings that rule this planet. And I guess that's about as much as I have to say. Thank you. All right. Give right. a little shout, Andy. Thanks, Ted. Oh, one thing. Uh, Tim, I understand. I understand. You're cool. All right. <laughs> thanks. Well, we'll close out the com uh, we'll close it out with a famous quote from Albert Einstein before he died. He said the human race is in a race between education and extinction, and I'm not sure which side is winning. <laughs> <laughs> We're adjourned for a night. We'll see you next week.